Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you back. My name is Kevin Mackey, and I'm going to be the session chair for these um, two papers, the first of which will be in person, the second one will be virtual. And so it's my, my pleasure to introduce to you um, Professor Yuka Tukari from Aalto University. And so um, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what I'm going to talk today uh, is, is to tell about experiments we've done, uh, and uh, it's group work. By, by myself, Iman, John, and Artu, and, and Iman and, and, and Artu are here. Uh, John. I've added one word from the program, and it's tensile. So, uh, so we, we studied size and rate effects in fracture of ice, and especially fracture of very warm freshwater ice and it was tensile the fracture we were looking at so 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 it is very well defined problem and and i my approach to science and research is that we should make the problems as simple as we can because then it's easier to solve if we have a too large problem it may be challenging to really really solve it and i think here and this is the same thing that i said 2017 why Newton is famous. Of course, he wrote a good equations, but at that, what was happening at that time, and he was leading the development, people stopped asking questions like, does God exist? What is good life? What is the meaning of life? But they started asking more simple questions like, why do things fall down? Because those are questions that we can answer. Taking that to a more humble life, I still think it's very, very important to try to define a question that has an exact answer. Otherwise, we don't know where we are. And tensile fracture is one of fundamental things of ice as a material. It has also applications, as, as Kai showed in the morning. Uh, ships and inclined structures break ice by bending, which means in tension. Waves bend ice, and so also wave-induced ice failure is in the end in, in tension, leads form in ice, and those are tensile failure. So tensile fracture is, is a practical and fundamental thing. The problem with fracture of ice is that, like many properties of ice, is that there are so many parameters that affect it. Uh, strain rate, temperature, salinity, size, grain size, grain orientation, we can continue that. Um, and in a simple way, we can define that ice is brittle at low temperature, low salinity, high strain rate, and ice is then ductile at high temperature, high salinity, low strain rate. But we don't know what is high and what is low in these different things. And of course, then they are interrelated, so that makes a complicated space of parameters. An important fe feature of tensile fracture of ice is that ice is a similar material than, than, than rocks and concrete that we call quasi-brittle materials and it is, they are fundamentally different than, than metals. In metals, um, metals yield at crack tips, there's yielding happening, but in quasi-brittle materials there's no yielding, such thing as yielding, but we have fracture processes and here fracture means cracks. Um, and, and also important is that the time is not, oh, there's a rate, but not time itself, but so ice has elastic viscoelastic viscoplastic properties. Uh, and what is kind of driving me today is that global warming is making ice warmer, and its global warming is creating more larger waves, and so there's more fragmentation, and there's more it's the, ice is, the ice is warmer. Uh, that is, of course, is a general thing. We are now talking about freshwater ice. And if you are planning to fall asleep after lunch, so there's so you can do it if you want. But please remember our main results. So size and rate effects are interrelated. We have known for decades that there are size effects and rate effects. Now we observe that they are interrelated. There's a size effect at low rates, and there's no size effect at high rates. 
that maybe is not so surprising, but I think we can look at the same result from another direction. We observed the rate effect at large si size, but we did not effect observe a rate effect at small size. And that the last one is the killer here, because so much slab work is done at small scale. It, it means that we may lose, we may not observe something that is in ice if we do our test at too small size. The second thing that relates to what, what Marchenko was telling us before the lunch is that when we were studying this very warm freshwater ice, uh, viscoelasticity was not there. Delayed elasticity was not there. Uh, I'm not sure if I understand why that is, but that's what we observed. Uh, this famous division of ice response to elasticity, viscoelasticity and viscoplasticity, three components. In our experiments, the second one was missing. And this talk is, is summarizes our work that is published on two papers in 21. One is uh, in Acta Materialia and one is, and the other one is published in, in, in the cryosphere. So there's more details in those, those two papers. So first, a short introduction to what is tensile fracture at all. So when I'm talking about fracture, I'm talking about fracture mechanics, I'm talking about cracks in, in materia. And uh, 101 years ago, Griffith uh, made this kind of statement for perfectly brittle materials that the crack will grow if the elastic energy released is larger than the surface energy, surface energy gamma. And then that equation, that kind of law can be then, or observation can be developed into a more simple equation for this kind of geometry. Sigma here is the load. A is the crack length, or 2A is the crack length because there's two, two uh, crack tips here. E is Young's modulus, and then gamma is the, is the uh, surface energy. This applies to perfectly brittle materials. Beautiful theory. If there's some plasticity happening, we can kind of make this a little bit larger, this gamma here. And then later in 1950s, then Irvin developed this terminology so that this left-hand side here is, is G, uh, crack release, energy release rate when crack is growing. And then the crack, there's a critical par parameter J sub C that then we can, we can measure. Uh, and then also the terminology goes that if we have tensile loading, the opening of a crack, we call it the mode one, and then the crack, the, the, the J sub C becomes J sub one, one C. Another important parameter in, in fracture mechanics is stress intensity factor. So stress state at near a crack tip looks like this. So the stress state somewhere here is a function of K, which is a stress intensity factor. And there's a geometry factor here. And then here we have uh, square root of two pi r. Now note that the r makes this a singular. The, so the, this kind of linear elastic fracture mechanics tells us that there's a singularity, stress singularity in the crack tip. There is no, not such a thing. Of course, there's some small scale things happening at the crack tip, but the mathematics gives us a singularity there. And then if we have, we can kind of put that, um, we can develop an equation for the K, uh, for the stress intensity factor. Again, we have a load here, crack length, and then we have a function depending on what kind of situation we have. And the crack will grow if K is larger than K sub C. And the one again here refers to this opening tensile mode. And the K1C is a fracture toughness, which is a material parameter. Then to ice. A lot of measurements have been done for the fracture toughness of ice. And if we want to do that, if we want to use fracture toughness for ice, which is parameter of the linear elastic fracture mechanics, LEFM, we need to fulfill certain kind of rules. So the material and that is a tough one for ice. We need to have not sensitivity, which means that the failure that occurs, it really is because of this. Experiments 
I is the, that there was no not sensitivity. It just was no no crack property. I mean, no fracture mechanics process is going on something else. Polycrystallinity means that when we do an experiment in the lab, we must have enough crystals there, enough ice grains, hundreds. So again, because ice grains are so large, if our samples are small, we ran into a problem. And then the fourth one, whatever fracture processes are occurring at the crack tip, they, they, that kind of zone, fracture process zone, FPZ, that must be small compared to the other dimensions. And, and, and these lead to, to size, size issues. Uh, long time ago, then Dempsey underlined us that, that there's no kind of agreed method to measure K1C for ice fracture toughness. There, is, there are standards for metals and also other materials, but none for ice. So let's not call this fracture toughness because these, these requirements are not met. And we, if we measure something, let's call it the apparent fracture toughness. KQ of ice shows both rate and size effects that has been measured. And also because linear elasticity is quite rare for ice, then, then Mulmul and Dempsey has developed kind of viscoelastic fracture model to kind of have more, more complicated material model for ice. And the fracture, the size effect is here. Uh, if one makes this kind of an experiment, John did, uh, John Dempsey did. So opening here, and this is then the KQ one sees, uh, the larger specimen you have, the higher uh, K you measure until you are at three, me three meters or so. And the same applies to crack tip opening displacement, which is crack tip is there. So what you measure here, it behaves in the same way. It, it reaches a plateau, it increases with the size and reaches a plateau at three meters. So we can apply LEFM, linear elastic fracture mechanics, if we are, if we have these large enough samples and if the loading is fast enough so that we are at the range of linear elasticity. A lot of discussion has been, has been going on this and in, in the book by Schulson and Duval, uh, they, they state that, that of course we have observed the size effect, but is it really due to the size or is it for other parameters and they write there also they they note that maybe the low maybe the loading rate was so low that there's there was viscous things happening and that caused then the the the, the size effect i mentioned this uh, viscoelastic modeling and that's this comes from rock research so I, I think this originates from concrete research in fact it does yes hillerbury was a Swedish scientist 1970s uh, studying fracture of concrete and, and they developed an idea that we have a crack tip here and in front of the crack tip is uh, something and that is then called a uh, fictitious crack or fracture process zone and in this in this area then in concrete one sees their micro cracking so that's that is then and then gradually when you, when loading is increasing gradually you get more and more micro cracking here and then here you don't see micro cracking so this kind of fictitious crack is here while the visible crack is there and then what's happening in this uh, zone process zone or fictitious crack part is developed by this kind of uh, um, cohesive processes sigma opening here uh, so it's so here so stress separation law mentioned here so and, and then how this comes down then as we open the crack depends on the material some materials behave like this and some materials behave like that so it's a material property how the stress separation law then looks like so tensile fracture is a kind of fundamental property there are questions we don't know all the answers and then we decided to to kind of take another attempt on this problem and we started studying fracture of, of warm ice. To me personally, uh, the, the, the driving force was that when we, because we have at Alto this Alto ice and wave tank, which is 40 by 40 meters, I noticed that I can, I can do huge specimen, in fact, in the lab. So then I'm, so, so then we maybe are really looking at 
scale and rate issues on, and not something like non-homogeneity of natural ice. It's not easy to find this scale uniform specimen of ice material in the nature. And then in, in, later on, I learned that this size range we reach 1 to, one to 39, uh, potentially nobody has studied any material in lab with such a size range. Uh, concrete research, they don't go into that large size ranges. So, but the reason is that we can make this ice sheet. So we, we grew a columnar ice to the thickness of uh, 34 centimeters, and then we started to do the experiments. And at the end of the experiments, the thickness was 41 centimeters. And here is our sample size. So, there's a, so they were not square, but the rectangular one to two is the ratio. We had a crack here. The crack was very long, 0.7 times this length. And that is for that when the crack starts to grow, when this long crack starts to grow in this geometry, it goes straight up. So we can measure what's happening at the crack front. We loaded it from here. Here is a 3D uh, drawing of, of how it was. It was columnar, the ice were like that. And the ice was seriously warm. Here is the, the temperature uh, distribution. So, so at the top, it was at minus one, minus 0 0.3. And at the bottom, it was at, at zero. Maybe if one wants to <coughs> use this warm ice, it must be floating. And because if you take that out of the water, it, it may not be so, so easy to, to study. Uh, the specimen sizes we used are shown here. So 19.5 times 39 meters, then six, three by six meters, and 0.5 times, times one meter. Uh, while doing the experiments, we were standing, standing we were working on the ice at, at the ice basin. And this is what the ice looks nice, freshwater S2 ice. So underlining here, nice S2 freshwater ice. Sea ice looks different, saline ice looks different. This was freshwater ice. How we analyze these things. So we used both linear elastic fracture mechanics and viscous, uh, viscoelastic fictitious crack model. Here's an equation by, 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 developed by Demps and BMU. So we measure the P max here, and then here are dimensions. And then we can just we measure the force. We know the dimensions. We can calculate K sub Q. Uh, the viscoelastic fictitious crack model is, is more complicated. I mean, and this is understatement. It's a lot more complicated. We need to assume uh, viscoelasticity. And, and this is the equation we used following the work by Cole and, and Shapery. So J is a uh, viscoelastic. Uh, compliance, one over Young's modulus, and then there's C and time, and C is here then a constant. How this is done is explained here. Um, it it's must be an iterative solution where we fit the, the VFCM model with uh, the, the, the measured displacements at these loca at the six locations, five locations, sorry, here. So we choose Based on our earlier understanding and earlier work, we, we choose the, 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 the creep compliance C. We choose a shape for this uh, curve, and, and then we choose the fracture process zone size. We solve the model, viscous, viscoelastic fictitious crack model. Then we obtain displacement, and then we minimize the difference between the measured and calculated displacement. Uh, in, in, in these locations at 15 time instances during the loading. And then we obtain another, we go then, then we obtain another C and, and softening curve, and then we go to two. And we continue that. We need a few hundreds of, of simulation, of, of iterations in this, in this method, and, and, and Iman developed this, this optimization method, then, then how, to, how to do this, and it, it, it then, then, then works. This shows kind of that there's, so there's measured and, 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 and measured load time trace from the largest specimen, 20 by 40 meter roughly. And, and then, then the red one is what we put into the model. And then this here shows how then the, the model gives a little, the model is not just as, as the model is stiffer than, than experiments, which is 
in fact, that's what's happening in solid mechanics, that, that mod our models are stiffer than, than the reality. In reality, we have infinite number of degrees of freedom, and in any model we have less. So it's, it makes sense that our models are, are stiffer. And then what we observe, this is, this is what we then observed. So here is the rate, fast tests are here, slow tests are here. So this, this failure happened in two seconds. This is roughly 1,000 seconds. And then what we see is that the small specimen, which is half a meter times meter, they are here. And then the larger ones, three by sixes and 19.5 times 36, they are, they are here. So, so the size and rate effects are interrelated. interrelated. When we go fast, there's no scale effect. When we go slowly, there is a scale effect. So these two things are interrelated. What is also interesting is that the very large specimen is here. Unfortunately, it's just one point there. It, so it's, it, it seems that there's no difference between 3.6 meter and, and this 20 by 40 meter specimen. That's cool because it means because it, this kind of meter scale in the lab is much, much more doable than if we meet tens of meters of, of specimen size. Nonlinear rate effects uh, quite nicely follows the power law relationship. This is the same result basically, but it just shows near crack. So it shows the displacement measured here, crack opening displacement here. Again, small specimen, no rate effect, large specimen, major rate, rate, rate effect. And note also that the displacement here near the crack tip uh, depends on the scale up to these three meters, because this, this one, the very large is here. So, so, the, so the processes that are happening at the crack tip, they do not forever scale up with the size, but, but it, because that's the, uh, then when the scale is large enough, they become material properties. Here you see what, what then uh, kind of what Iman then back calculated for the stress separation curve. And what, what we learn here is that the tensile strength of ice, here we see the tensile strength of ice, which is one from one to 1 to 0.3 MPA makes sense. And, and then also we see that at, at, if we have a slow rate, so the, there's first kind of flat portion and then it drops. If we do a lot high rate test, it goes down immediately. So, so at higher rates, the, the failure is more brittle. Of course, that we know beforehand, but this is how it shows then in the stress separation curve. We can calculate the fracture energy out of that. And they, there you see what kind of fracture energies we get for, 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 this, for this fresh water, very warm fresh water ice. Again, same, same rate and, and size effects there. Uh, this shows the process zone size at the crack tip. Uh, and, and so it's like, this is complicated. So micrometers to, to 10 to four, so three, three millimeters. So here we have three millimeters and there we have 18 millimeters. So, so that's the range where we are. Is that the large fracture process zone? That we can all, all think about, but that's the size that, that comes out of these, these experiments. And I think this is, uh, to me, this is again an important result. So here we have the, the, the creep compliance function J, and this is the equation. And one over E, so, so this dashed line here is one over E. So it means that when we are going faster in the experiments, this creep compliance is approaching linear elasticity or elasticity. But we need to go really fast. So, so we need to go for tests, like, like if we think that this is fast enough, here, this is close enough, it means that linear elasticity makes sense when the test lasts less than one to two seconds. If we go faster than one to two seconds in this, in this conditions, then this term here starts to kind of kick in and, and the compliance is something else than elasticity. Then there was the, before I said that you can, you can sleep now that I had two things to tell you. 
the, the, the other one was this delayed elasticity or the lack of this delayed elasticity in, in, in warm ice. This is the textbook stuff and this has been the textbook stuff since Sinha kind of introduced this to ice community in 1978. So if, if we have this kind of a load, if we impose this kind of loading to, to a material, so at time t sub zero, we go up, then we have a constant load, and then at t1, we come down. This is how kind of the textbook ice behaves. So there's, there's immediate elastic response, and then there's viscoelastic and viscoplastic things that happen during the time. When we take the load away, we have the immediate elasticity comes, comes off, of course, because that's elasticity. Then we have viscoelasticity, which is this curve here. And then what is left is then the viscoplastic component. So this is, this is kind of the, and, and this has been experimentally confirmed, number of experiments, including what Alexei Marchenko showed two hours ago. That this curve was clearly in, in the data he showed. And this is what we then, so, so what we did was that we loaded like this four times up, 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 and then down, and then we broke the, 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 the sample. And then this, this is what we saw. So at, at crack, kind of crack mouth displacement, so close to the, where the loading was, then at the crack tip, and then this is somewhere in the middle of, of the crack. And, and this is then the response. And if I zoom in, and this is now three by six, Specimen. Now, if I if I zoom in, so this is what we what we then see. So the viscoelasticity is not there. So it's uh, when we start loading it, like here we start loading it, it goes up, then it's increasing with time. We unload it immediately, and then it's flat. So it's elastic viscoplastic only. The viscoelasticity is somewhere, uh, and and this was we were seriously puzzled. And, and, and I, can, I can, can ensure you that we really tried to find where is, our, where is the error, because this was not something that we expected to see, and, 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 and we looked, but there is no, we haven't found the error. I, I cannot say that there is no error, but we really seriously kind of suspected that we have done something wrong, but we, I don't think we, we did anything wrong. We just are, this is just how very warm ice behaves. Um, no, no uh, delayed elasticity. So what was different to many tests that have been done, done before? Uh, that it was very warm and that our specimen were large. They were large compared to many, many, many other specimens. Why is this? Some liquid at the grain boundaries because it is so, so, so warm. So, so maybe the grain boundary sliding was, was viscoplastic. Maybe that's, maybe that's the solution. This, this crack tip thing, there's not even it doesn't come down at all at the crack tip. It comes down more, and maybe that is some, some delayed elasticity, maybe that there, but you need a microscope to really look at that. So we don't know what are the, 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 why this really happened, but these are some possible uh, explanations uh, that we discuss in, 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 the, in the paper. But this is, uh, this is what we measured, and, and, and we will continue from this then to try to find out that what, what we really did observe. Summary, so, so and I'm well in time. So large scale creep and fracture experiments were conducted in lab with very warm freshwater ice. First result, size and rate effects interrelated. Second result, consistent result for sizes from three, three times six meters and larger. LEFM valid in these in our experiments as long as the time to failure is below one to two seconds and no viscoelasticity or no, no delayed elasticity was observed the ice was just elastic viscoplastic and this concludes my 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 talk today
All right, thank you, Yuka. So we have ample time for discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you, very nice talk. Just one question for understanding. I'm not very finely tuned on those kinds of things. So just to understand, so when you say plasticity, so on the previous uh, um, panel, um, so plastic deformation, is that always connected with crack formation or can you have plastic deformation without crack formation? What I mean here is that it's something that stays here. Yeah, I understand. So, so elastic plastic. But I mean, do you have a, if you have a plastic deformation, do you always see a crack or, or can you have that without any cracks? To certain stage, yes. But then, but then I mean, if you have, then, then, but the grains are sliding. So what is the big, we ran into this problem of what is a crack. <laughs> but, but, but I mean, if, if we have grain boundary sliding, so the grains are really moving. I mean, in relation to each other, are we creating there some some damage we are creating there mm. for sure? So, yeah. yeah. So I, I no, we don't need to. I would say that we don't need cracks to have to have permanent deformation. Okay. Thank you. When can I have one more question? Okay. If you so when you apply the load to this ice sample, basically you, you apply the, you know you had a picture. It goes like this. Um, yeah. 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 So is there a particular reason for why you apply the load and here? Yeah, exactly. Why you could apply it also, let's say, you know, from the top or, you know, in, in, in the sheer load or. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the benefit one. Yeah, sure. The benefit of this one is that this, this specimen, when it's loaded like this, the loading is self equilibrating. Hmm. We don't need any support anywhere because mm -hmm. once 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 you have a support somewhere the ice may start cracking there <laughs> the support may not be as stiff as as we want here the only thing we need to take care of is that this is stiff mm -hmm. enough how we, but it's only one thing we we're just we're producing the load at one location only and that's that's why this is beneficial but then of course if you want to study shear then you need a different thing and of, if you want to study like punch through things then you need another type of loading but for in-plane loading I think this is this is the way to, to go because it is self equilibrating thank you um, I have a personal question uh, in the uh, factory problem uh, we are saying for ice uh, we are using the condition that if uh, the uh, stress intensity factor that K is function of time, which is uh, uh, if your load is function of time, then the crack move in such a way that at each time instant, the intensity factor is equal to uh, uh, fracture toughness. Say that again, I couldn't okay. follow you. Um, so we need the uh, kind of um, uh, equation to calculate how the crack propagate. Mm. Right? So we are using the condition that at each time instant, the uh, um, stress intensity factor either smaller than mm -hmm. uh, uh, toughness, uh, ice toughness, than the null propagation, yeah, yeah. either it's equal. Okay. Is it the sense? Yeah. Make a sense. Yeah, it cannot be larger, of course, because then yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It cannot already. be larger, but the yeah. it's always move uh, uh, in our model. It's moves at the at the, so the uh, change uh, in the, the stress situation is changing all the time. Yeah, it's changing, and then it's propagate in such yeah. a way that yeah. I mean, is it has I mean, sense? L, L, yeah, earlier. I, I think that makes makes sense as long as your process is fast enough. Fast enough, yeah. It's yeah so yeah, that the time time so that the viscous issues won't won't get milliseconds, in, milliseconds, yeah. milliseconds. Yeah. yeah, and then the uh, oh, sorry uh, another question. He, um, you mentioned that fictitious crack, so the, that uh, narrow zone in front mm. of the main crack, and uh, this zone with the micro crack. So mm. it's uh, something. It's not crack actually, but it's also, also not the main material. No. So how to model that? <laughs> so think. The, how to model that is that in, 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 this, in this kind of viscoelastic fictitious crack model, it is modeled with the softening curve. This is the, this is the model, this is the material model to, to this process zone. So here we have the opening how open this crack is and here we have the, the 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 strength of the material so it does so this is tensile strength 
So here we have the tensile strength when it's not op it has not opened at all. So this is like a cohesive model. But then when the crack is opening, it doesn't come down like this, but it, it comes gradually down when the crack is opening. And then when the, when the opening reaches this delta sub C, then the stress is zero. So this is, this is, a, this is what's called a cohesive crack model. So, so this is the model. Models of cracks which use these IDs or, or using a damage function that goes from zero to one, from one case to the other one, which you know, opened the opened the way to a phase field model for cracks. Mm. Did you did you try it? Because it's very similar in some sense. You you might not have to use this function depending on time, but using the, uh, the dynamics for this damage function that could maybe give you a, a more general. We framework. did not use other models than than these two linear elasticity and then this this visco, visco, viscous model. That's that's all we used now at at, at this stage, but but. Uh, but what you described has been used with eyes on kind of in damage mechanics sense. But then you have a cloud of cracks. I mean, and now we are looking at the single sure. single crack tip. So it, it is a slightly, so this is not a damage mechanics problem. Except here, of course, one sure. can think that in this process zone. And, and of course, you can, if you, if you then make this a linear yeah, model. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Would you like to read it or? Okay. Um, okay. I can, I can just read it. Thank you. Um, this question is no elastic lag means the viscosity of void unit is very large. I can't see any contradiction to viscoelastic models, just other value of rheological constant. Is it correct? Zero. I mean, <laughs> Just other value, zero. Yeah, yeah. No, viscosity very large. So in that case, void unit is not working. No, I did not hear. I mean, okay. So, um, Alexi, could you read your question? I think we can hear you all right. If you, um, yeah, yeah, through. just. Uh, Void unit is not working when viscosity is uh, very large. If it is infinite, so then no void unit at all, hmm. only maximal unit. Okay, okay. I'm not sure if I understand what you mean, but, but if something is infinite or zero, of course they are just values those, but, but I mean, comparing kind of that, because I don't see this curve, so here, to me, it's yeah, not there. Exactly. So that what we we see also very big difference between vertical and horizontal samples. Mm -hmm. And in test with vertical samples, we didn't see big uh, big coverage as well. Yeah, yeah. And this is horizontal loading. Yeah. Yeah, but you have different type of eyes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, maybe one more uh, comment that uh, this elastic lock is, re is related in literature to the rotation of grains after unloading. And due to the relative rotation of grain, a part of elastic deformations is getting back from inside the grain. Mm. So it means that in your situations, grains are not rotating. Or grains are not connected. I mean, that's what I said. There's liquidity between the grains. So even if the grains are coming back, yeah, the, so the, the cracks... it, yeah, exactly. It could be like that. So that that is just a structure. Yeah, the, the, the grains just grains, 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 and the elasticity within grains they just bounce back. But when they are not connected with each other, we don't see it in in the, yeah. in, in the specimen. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. then that that's clear. Thank you. Yeah. All right, any, any more questions? Um, we have a few more minutes. If I could ask a question about this, uh, the same issue that maybe will help me understand. So viscous, viscoelasticity is a model and you observe it um, while it's being loaded, at least in, your, in, the, in the cartoon on the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, is it a different physical process 
when it's loaded versus when you read the phone. So it Bounce back. We are creating permanent yeah. things, <laughs> permanent deformations, permanent something in, in the ice. Uh, we cannot see it in, in these experiments. Some other experiments we could try to see it, but in these experiments we did not see anything. We just measure the response at the sample size okay. level. Yeah. And you and you get it back partially when you release the load. Yeah. Okay, and then maybe just the last one, you know, in, in the fluid mechanics, the viscosity is associated with a energy loss. Could you help me understand, where is that, is there energy loss also with the, the viscoelastic? Here, it, it does, the, the terminology, oh yes, but, but here, the, it says that it's time related. Okay. That's, that's the, the point here is that it's, it's time related. So it's, okay, similar model in, in fluid mechanics, it could be energy loss here, it's not strictly energy loss or directly more as directly it, viscoelasticity doesn't have in it because it's it's viscoelasticity because elastic is it's coming elastic yeah. re reversible so then the the energy losses are kind of of course they are there in the material some some there can be some 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 kind of hysteresis loops but but I mean, plasticity then it's of course when we get a permanent deformation we have we have lost something yeah okay um, maybe we'll, okay. Time. time to time to go. Oh, one more. Do you want one? Yeah, <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's go. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I could miss something. But uh, did you try to simulate uh, these processes and to, com to compare with your experimental results? Not 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 in any other way than 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 kind of uh, this way. So, so, so this is kind of how, how we solve the, because in a way we did, in a way this analysis is combined numerical and experimental method because to, to kind of, because this viscoelastic this crack model, it has so many parameters and we don't measure them directly, but we, we, we kind of match the response with the displacements we, we measure. So, you know, in that sense, we did simulate it. But but no but not kind of not in a separate way. Did, we did not develop any any FEM model yeah. with, with that. No, no no. This was experimental. No no. This was experimental. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, I think we can thank our speaker one more time. Yeah.